Hello everyone, my name is Jamin West. I'm an agentic engineer. Um, I have been using LLMs to write production grade code for as long as it has been possible. Um, and last night I gave a presentation at um, AI Tinkerers here in Seattle um, and I got some really good feedback on it. People seem to really enjoy the talk so I figured I would make a video about it and um, spend a bit more time talking about the concepts that I discussed last night. So the whole point of this presentation is to try and clarify where I believe uh, agentic engineering and using LLMs to write code is heading. So I've broken this down into three stages, more or less. Um, so stage one here, when it comes to using LLMs to write code, um, this is where I think most developers today are using LLMs and how they're using LLMs. So I want to be clear before I jump into this that Claude Code um, is a stand-in for really any LLM dev tool. It could be Cursor, it could be um, Codex, it could be AMP, whatever it is. Uh, I'm just going to use Claude Code because it's the most popular. But again, it could be a stand-in for anything. So stage one, like I said, this is where I think most developers are at right now. Um, and what this looks like is the developer has a conversation with a single Claude Code instance. So it's a back and forth conversation, obviously. And in this conversation, the developer will work on exploration, planning, implementation, testing, etc. cetera. Um, and this all happens in, like I said, a single conversation with Claude Code. So this is back and forth. Um, you're sort of iterating with the agent to work on next steps. Maybe you have um, some MCP servers plugged in or You've begun fiddling around with things like slash commands, um, but for the most part, you're using Claude code on the default settings to uh, accomplish multi-step tasks. Again, this is stage one. Stage two, um, this is where I think people that have been using these tools um, since Claude code came out earlier this year, um, this is where I think a lot of developers are at, and this is sort of the next step. So. Similar to stage one, the developer is having a conversation with Claude Code. However, this conversation now includes slash commands and meta prompting, so getting more reliable results from Claude Code, as well as having more control over the context engineering that goes into Claude Code's process. Right? And then, so at this point, you're also using MCP servers to get Claude Code real-time data so that it can take action on um, external services as well as read data from external services. Maybe you've even built your own custom MCP servers. That's great. Um, there's also sub-agents now. So if you've messed around with Claude Code, you know that sub-agents are possible. Um, you can have custom sub-agents that you can trigger within Claude Code or have Claude Code um, spawn and then these sub agents can take action. Um, so now let's say that instead of just having a single Claude code instance doing all of the different steps, you have a single Claude code instance which you're having a conversation with, and then that Claude code instance is spawning sub agents to take care of exploration, planning, implementation, you know, etc. This stage also involves um, using isolated instances of Claude Code, so um, using Git work trees, for example, or running multiple Claude Code instances at once. So if you have four or five agents running at a single time that are all working on different things or working on smaller parts of one larger task, that I think would still fall into stage two because you're still having conversations with the actual Claude Code instances. You're still discussing with the LLM what needs to be done in what order as it's doing it. So then we move on to stage three, and stage three looks a lot different than the first two stages. Um, you can see that the developer is no longer just having a conversation with Claude Code. In fact, Claude Code, um, in the format that we understand it now, um, of this like conversational back and forth, it's this LLM that you're chatting with in your command line or in VS Code or whatever, um, that is gone from stage three. And I'm gonna explain a little bit about why. So instead of using the Claude Code conversational interface um, as the first two stages have 
Stage three utilizes the Claude Code SDK. And I want to reiterate that Claude Code is just a stand in here. Codex has an SDK. Uh, AMP, I think, has an SDK. So it could be any LLM coding assistant SDK. I use the Claude Code SDK. I think it's the best one out there right now. So that's what I'm using. But in stage three, the developer will trigger a script. Um, and this could be done, you know, just running a Python file on the command line. Or it could be done with things like GitHub Webhook. So every time you open a new issue, it triggers your agentic workflow. So the agentic workflow is um, just what it sounds like. It's a series of agents that you have set up custom for your project that are handling different steps of the workflow. So a super important concept here is that um, each of these agents is working with one prompt, it has one task, and it's just a single agent. So that single agent can spawn sub-agents if it would like to um, use them to help in this specific task that it's working on. But imagine instead of having one single Claude Code instance taking care of planning out the feature, for example, um, you know, exploring the code base, implementing the feature, writing the tests for the feature, Instead of one agent handling all of that, this is now um, deferred to several agents, each in charge of one step of that process. Um, a good sort of starting point for agentic workflows is to think of the software development lifecycle. Um, and you feel free to go look that up and understand the different steps that go into the software development lifecycle, but um, you'll see that there are different stages and for each of those stages, it makes sense to have a singular, a singular specialized agent working on each phase. So this is still contains the uh, slash commands and meta prompting from stage two, as well as the sub agents and MCP servers. However, now instead of one singular cloud code instance having access to all of those, each agent in your agentic workflow will have access to each of these. So. This makes it highly, highly, highly consistent between runs and um, very predictable. So the agentic workflow will run after you've triggered it um, and there can be you know, one to n agents per workflow. So any number of agents per workflow and they will output uh, the workflow result, whatever that looks like for your project. So for me, example, I use a pull request. So I will feed this script an issue number you know, let it run for 20 or so minutes. And then um, the end result will be a pull request open in GitHub for me by my agentic workflow. And then there is the, you know, review CI CD testing phase, um, which just confirms, you know, the agents did the right thing. They implemented the feature or fixed the bug or whatever correctly. And uh, this is a manual process. However, it doesn't need to be manual. This can also be um, another agentic workflow. So what this looks like in an abstract sense is having an agentic layer um, sort of surrounding your code base. It, it becomes a piece of infrastructure in your code base. So you can sort of think of stage three as tools like Devon or Codex Web, um, these companies that have created or promised to create agents that are like you know junior engineers in the cloud. So they can take any task that you throw at them they'll run for however long and then give you the output that you're looking for. If that's a pull request, if that's, you know, whatever. Um, my argument here is that instead of using tools like Devon and Codex Web, the developer and the developer team should focus on building this agentic layer around the code base for themselves. So this means not deferring the actual agentic workflow to a third party and the benefit of doing so, of building your own agentic layer, is that you can customize this um, to your project infinitely. So this could, you know, you can prime it um, so that every agent knows exactly your test commands, knows the philosophy that you go into your project with, knows how your team operates, knows your team's culture, um, so on and so forth. That's where the real leverage comes in here. So I'm gonna jump into some code 
Um, and this is, I'm just going to be brief with this code. It's not an open source repo. This is a, a closed source repo, unfortunately. But um, I'm going to show you a little bit about what this agentic layer looks like for my specific code base. So here I'm in GitHub. I have uh, this issue that I'd like to tackle, 369. Um, it's just a, a bug fix. Um, and I had an agent go through and create this really nice detailed issue talking about you know, what the problem is, how it could be fixed, um, acceptance criteria, et cetera. So this is a prompt, that, um, a slash command really that I've had in Claude code. So I wanna be clear, when I'm making issues like this, I'm still using that uh, stage two sort of development process where I'm having a conversation with Claude code. However, I'm making heavy use of things like slash commands to make sure that this is super consistent. So all of my GitHub issues will look like this and they're all built with this level of detail. So again, this is a issue that I want to tackle, uh, 369. So I'll jump into the code base here. And um, I will, I'm going to kick off a script and as it's running, I'll uh, sort of describe what's happening. So this is my um, code base. This is my application code base. You can see I have uh, an app layer, which is the backend API. Um, I also have a web, which is the front end. And then I have some shared types uh, as well as uh, all the docs. So something interesting you'll see in uh, this specific repo is uh, I have this docs specs file or a directory rather. And you can see that each of these spec files is very cleanly formatted. You know, it tells exactly what issue number it's working on, uh, a nice slug that goes with the issue. And you can see I have, you know, hundreds of these things. So these are built by agents, of course. Um, but the real key here and the important aspect of this code base is the automation layer. So the automation layer is how I do development now. It's not through cloud code conversations. It's not through um, hands-on coding, of course. Um, instead, it is this new automation layer that I've implemented in the code base that acts, again, as infrastructure. And within the automation la layer, I have uh, ADWs, which are AI developer workflows, and This is essentially a code base totally on its own. This, this automation layer does not directly interact with any of the layers of my actual product. It doesn't interact directly with the um, application layer, the API, or the web interface. Now, it can have influence over those layers. It can make edits to them, but the actual code is not talking to one another. So this is purely an infrastructure layer the outside of the actual functionality of my code base. Um, and it all sort of stems from this agent.py file. So this agent.py file is essentially the backbone of every agentic workflow in my code base. Um, and what this agent.py file does is essentially just wrap the Claude Code SDK um, in my own custom implementation of it so that I get all the power of the Claude Code SDK, but if, for example, OpenAI releases some mind-blowing Codex SDK, I can easily swap out Claude Code for Codex um, and vice versa. It's not that difficult to make the switch for my agentic workflow. So I can always use the best tool available, which is not something that you'll have access to if you're relying on things like Codex Web or Devin, because you just they're sort of black boxes or they are um, provider-specific. OpenAI is, of course, going to use OpenAI models for all of their coding tasks. So we can see this script is getting to work. And essentially what's happening here, I'm not going to let this run all the way through because this is going to take 20 plus minutes to run. Um, but essentially what's happening here is you can see that, you know, it opened up a new ADW ID, which is just a um, hash. Those are all the files exchanged. But you can see it's saving a prompt, uh, the output is saved, etc. So in this automation directory, um, now I can go into the uh, 
trees section. So this is where all of the work trees happen. These are isolated environments for my agents to work. So this is not, it's not, you know, taking over my code base, taking over my computer and going crazy. It is isolated into this work tree. So all the agents are operating on issue 369 within this bug 369 hash um, directory. So I can always go in here, I can always stop this mid implementation and check out what is actually being implemented, have uh, you know, a more hands-on experience with the code that is being written. This is all happening on my machine, so I don't have to you know, wait until whatever provider I'm using, Devin, is done and then review all the code at the end. I can, I can monitor what's going on um, in real time to see you know, what's happening. Um, additionally, all of my agents have uh, logs related to them. So let's see, what's this hash? This is CFE. Let's see if we can find this agent here. So yeah, CFE, and I can see the current state that's happening. So you can see it's, you know, it's invoked four agents at this point. Um, this is exactly what I'm looking for. And on top of this, uh, there's also logging output. So I'm gonna go through and show you just a little bit about what the logging looks like for an agentic workflow like this. Let me find the correct one. Looks like this one doesn't have logging going on. So I'll just open up a um, example one here. So these are all the different phases that are happening. These are all the different agent calls that are happening in an example issue. Um, we can see exactly what API calls are being made to Claude code. Um, as well as the output of the model. So this is obviously a huge file because this is the implementation agent. So this is the agent that is actually changing the code base. Um, and you can see, obviously, it's, it's doing a ton of work here. I mean, this is several thousand lines worth of API calls, which is awesome. I mean, this is great. And I can always go through here. And in terms of like observability or evaluations, this is sort of how I handle that. Um, but that's just sort of a general overview of what I've built in my current code base. It's sort of a jumping off point for you and your team. This is not like a tutorial on how to build this. This is more just a showcase of this is possible. This is how you should be thinking about developers or developing um, because teams that are implementing this automation layer, this infrastructure layer uh, that develops their code base for them, it's gonna be night and day between teams that do this and teams that do not do this. That's, that's my opinion, but again, I've been working on this for as long as it has been possible, so it's an informed opinion. Um, before I wrap this video up, I want to shout out Indie Dev Dan. Um, he is leading the way with Agentic Engineering, um, his tactical AI courses. Um, I get no benefit from this, I'm not trying to sell these, but these are really, really, I think, the cutting edge of where you can take multi-agent workflows, how you can develop massive code bases with LLMs in a way that actually works. So I would highly, highly recommend if you're interested in learning more, go check out this channel, um, go buy his courses because again, I think they are more than worth the money. So huge thank you to Indie Dev Dan for this. Um, again, my name is Jim and West. I appreciate you watching. Um, hopefully this is making sense and you can sort of see where agentic engineering is heading. I'm pretty excited about this. I think this is the future. So if you enjoyed, feel free to uh, follow me on LinkedIn, check out my website, um, check out CodeIDB, the code base that I was working on in this video, and let me know what you think. Leave a comment on this and thank you for watching.